Nearly three weeks since Australian immigration officials walked out of Manus Detention Centre and left around 600 men to their own devices. Tonight we've seen new vision seen for the first time of the men inside Manus at Crisis Point. This footage, secretly taken four days ago, showing the squalor refugees on Manus are enduring as their standoff continues. No running water, no food supplied, no power, no medication. The situation is dire. We are really depressed about it because every day we have to think about the people who are really sick. The men are still refusing to move to alternative accommodation on the island. There's no safety for us out there. And some of our friends who left the detention centre two years ago, it's hundreds of you know, armed robbery. They've been beaten up, they've been robbed. With the searing tropical heat and filth, a simple burn from hot water like this could become fatal. We're talking about a developing country, a poor part of a developing country in the tropics. If there's not access to clean water, to basic health care, well then the risks just increase day on day. There are some weird symptoms we are seeing it right now. When you look at the skins of, of someone, it looks like it's burned and it's really itchy. Doctors and nurses and medicines is bad from coming in here. So the men with diabetes and epilepsies and the men with the heart problems, we don't have an access to help those men at the moment. Refugees say 150 of the men need regular medication and without supervision, mistakes are being made. Because he was in pain and then he took his free session of tablet at one time. So what happened, he was unconscious for 24 hours and we were really, really worried that this man, he gonna lose his life and in front of us, in the absence of their normal meds, some men are trying to regulate themselves with whatever's available. 20 cups of coffee a day, sometimes 30. A couple of guys, they haven't slept for a week. For a week, they haven't put their heads on the pillow. If there's nothing to hide, if these men aren't at immediate risk, there's no reason why the government would not allow a group of independent medical experts to make sure that these men are safe. Professor Patrick McGorry is a former Australian of the Year and one of Australia's leading mental health experts and he joins us now. Patrick, the uh, Asylum Seeker Resource Centre snuck in to film that secretly last Thursday. What did you think when you saw the footage? Well, um, I wasn't totally surprised because when you leave uh, 400 men under those conditions with no water, food, medical support or uh, treatment, uh, it's not surprising that the situation would deteriorate fairly rapidly. Well, I've read some of your comments today and you've said, you know, we've got a situation where there is a perfect storm brewing here. Well, if you just look at the mental health side of it, which is obviously my, my area, I've worked with refugees for many years. These men are chronically uh, depressed, suicidal, many of them are very much on the brink of suicide. And they have been provided with mental health support and, and, and uh, antidepressant medication and so on while the services were available. All of this has disappeared. So you've got the combination of withdrawal from psychotropic drugs, the return of the underlying depression and mental health condition. So I just think there are three or four <coughs> factors here which are really conspiring to put their lives at extreme risk. Professor McGorry, I mean, no one wants to see anyone come to any harm. My understanding is that uh, there is medical care provided at the alternative centre that's now been opened and that the people providing that are the same people who were providing the care at the centre that's been closed down. Can't somebody <coughs> convince these men, if it's as bad as what you say it is, to move? Yeah. That's, that's, that's actually a good point because the priority here is saving their lives, right? So that means providing uh, food, water, uh, medical care at the earliest possible opportunity. There seem to be two options for that. One is an, an alternative site, which the government says is, is, is ready to go. Um, I, I've heard different reports about that. The other alternative would be to reopen the camp and, and reinstitute, uh, re reinstate the services uh, on site. Now, I must say, the whole situation is, is incredibly... Uh, lacking in trust on, on, on all sides. So that's part of the reason why the men are unwilling to leave the, 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 the current camp, because they don't really have confidence in what they're being told anymore, I don't think. Well, you've said, Patrick, that preventable deaths seem not only inevitable, as you've mentioned, but imminent. Do you think it's going to take the death of one of these men before the, the Australian government reacts? Um, I don't really know. I mean, there have been deaths before. Um, we know, we, we've known for years that detaining people with, with no uh, end in sight uh, results in inevitable suicidal behaviour and, and deaths from suicide. So 
I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not sure what it will take, how, how many deaths it will take. So the government always um, falls back on the, on, 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 the, on the fact that they believe public opinion is not sympathetic to these men, but surely a point has been reached now where their, their lives are at risk. It's a, it's a humanitarian and health crisis. It's extraordinary we're having a conversation about how many deaths something will take. I don't think I've ever heard that in the course of an interview before. But Patrick, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Molly.